All right, it is 7.30, and uh, so I'm gonna start the preliminaries, and um, people will probably straggle in that the way they do, but, uh, but we're here and we're going. Um, so I'll start with a, a good morning. I'm Mike Keese, I'm the Workforce Housing Coordinator here at Vital Communities. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce Doreen Gillette. Please weave, wave Doreen, she's our tech host today. Um, and uh, we'll make things work for us. Um, one of the things that's happening is we're recording and um, Doreen is presenting the slides. And to make sure that everyone has access to this, we'll also um, be putting a link to the slides in the chat so you can follow along on your own. And Doreen, if you wouldn't mind doing that now and, and periodically as people come in, that'd be fantastic. Um, and, and so we're gonna kick off this morning with a welcome by Sarah Jackson who is our executive director here at Vital Communities. Um, we've been appreciating Sarah's leadership and partnership building since she joined this team in November last year. And it is so great that she can get us started today with this event. So Sarah, I'll hand over to you and off we go. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to all of our partners who are joining us this morning and, and joining us in tackling the housing crisis in the Upper Valley. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise, so apologies if it's coming from me. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I'm delighted that so many diverse members of our community are committing time and energy to tackle this shared challenge. Vital Community's mission is to engage Upper Valley people, communities and organizations to create equitable solutions to our region's challenges. We've known for years that our current systems for the development of homes are not meeting our needs. <clears throat> and the COVID pandemic has made that chronic challenge an acute crisis. Today's breakfast will present multiple examples for businesses, nonprofits, towns, and residents of all ages and circumstances to lead and support the creation of the homes we need. The solutions you'll hear about this morning are as varied as the resources and needs of our communities, but they have two things in common. First, imagination and commitment to tackle this challenge. And second, confidence in our neighbors that we can and will meet this challenge together. Thank you again for being here. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I, I'm, if Doreen, if you can pop up the agenda slide, I'll talk us through this morning's events. Great, thank you. Um, as you can see, our agenda this morning starts with the big picture. Uh, the Keys to the Valley Project takes a look at where we are today and the changes that we need to bring about over the next decade. It also shows us the roles that we can play in making those changes and some of the resources that can help us. So very much looking forward to hearing about that project. Um, we're then gonna take a look at five examples of change that are happening right now. Um, these are solutions that we can expand and replicate in our region. Then it's your turn. We'll use the Q&A time to clarify and explore how we can implement the dozens of solutions that are laid out in Keys, including the examples that we highlight this morning. So we'll hold all the questions to the end. And if your questions arise during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and then we'll talk about them during the Q&A. Um, we're gonna wrap up the Q&A with a summary of next steps and, and how we'll be able to measure our shared progress. And then uh, we're gonna close out this morning by uh, highlighting that we have the power to do this together. So um, you can follow along on the screen with the slides. Um, Doreen's going to put a link to the chat in there, excuse me, a link to the slides in the chat so you can also open up your own version at home. And uh, I think if, if you're all ready, I suspect Kevin Geiger is. Kevin, you all set? Yes. Then away we go. Keys to the Valley. Okay. Good morning, everybody out there. I uh, hope you've had your virtual muffin and your real coffee or your decaf, whatever. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm from the Two Rivers Atacuichi Regional Commission. And with me this morning, which you'll hear in a minute, is Olivia from the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission and Jason from the Mount Escutney Regional Commission. And we're gonna talk very briefly about the Keys to the Valley project, which has been done, 
by S3 commissions over the last two years. And this is just like a, a teaser. There, there is a, a full movie waiting out there later for you. And if you want to go to the next slide, Mike. Oh, just oh, back one. Uh, yeah, so I just want to note that we're very grateful to our whole series of advisors and our funders, without which um, we can't do this project. You know, this is a, a pretty heavy duty lift for the last couple of years. And so one more slide, Mike. Yep, uh, this is just a map of the area we cover. So the three regional planning commissions cover 67 towns and cities, and this is the entire area for the Keys to the Valley project roughly 163,000 people. And we set out to identify three problems. The, the first thing is what we usually do is, you know, what's the housing needs out there? So what's the problem? The, the other parts that were unusual are, what are the solutions out there? And then which solutions really fit our areas? And we'll have several examples today, but you can find many more at the Keys to the Valley website. Next one. This, I think, is the key takeaway. It's, it's not a surprise, uh, but it's something that we keep uh, beating the drum on. Um, and so this is our first key understanding is that we're in a housing crisis and it's getting worse. It's not getting better. And before any of us can address any issue in our lives, you have to face it squarely and you have to acknowledge it. And we have many excellent people and programs in place around affordable housing in the region. And I, I wanna stress that. And they have done a lot and saved a lot of heartache and housed a lot of people. And yet we still have to admit that we, the big we, not they, um, have done a dismal job of meeting the needs of our people in terms of affordable housing. And the big takeaway on that is a third of our households, you know, 23,000 households are not affordably housed in the region right now. And to give you a sports analogy, if you miss the ball a third of the time in baseball, you're actually a very good hitter. If you miss the ball a third of the time in golf, you're a very bad golfer. And I want us to think that we're golfing here, folks. And only with that sense of how hard we need to improve our game will we come to the table with a resolve to make the changes that we need to be making. At the very high level, we need to uh, triple the rate of construction of housing, roughly out there. We need to almost by tenfold increase the rate of affordable housing. Uh, and by affordable housing, I don't just mean um, the standard HUD definition of affordability. I also mean what we call missing middle housing or, you know, housing uh, that is typically for the middle class. At the state level, we need to move tax policy to drive the behavior we want. At the local, we need to change zoning, invest in infrastructure like sewer and water, especially, and understand that a community houses all of its people or it does not succeed. And at the personal level, we just need to welcome the new neighbors across the street, uh, you know, the new house going up on the lot, that type of thing. Don't fear that, uh, embrace that change. Uh, next slide, next, just not next slide, but yeah. yeah. These are, um, so we have uh, four more key understandings. And this one is it's not just a private problem. Yeah, if a policeman can't find a home, it's a problem for the town. If a machinist can't find a home, it's a problem for their employer. So it's not just on the people out there. It's on, again, it's on all of us. Next one. Yep, tough problem. Nobody else has solved this thing. There, we have looked and looked and looked. People have done a lot of work. They've solved a lot of bits, but nobody has solved this entirely. Um, and so we have to uh, acknowledge it's a serious issue. And I think one more, yeah, uh, new solutions are needed. Obviously, if you haven't fixed any problem, you need to do something differently than what you've been doing. So we're gonna need to do some different things. And one more maybe. And, you know, we have a beautiful place and we wanna respect that place while we're solving the problem. So we want urgency, but we want care while we're doing this. Next slide. And at the Keys site, you'll see that we've grouped our, uh, what we want people to do into these six action areas. Each of these has a little plus on the side. If you hit that plus, a paragraph comes up. You can then dive deeper and deeper and deeper. There's actually three more layers below all of these, but we figured we'd start with the condensed versions and then people can expand as they 
need to. And we're going to have, as Mike said, five examples of things already being taken at the local level, which are to me a little novel, which is neat. But before we get down to those, Olivia is going to talk a little bit about where things might happen and why. And then Jason is going to talk a little bit about how and what it might actually look like. And then back to you, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. Can everyone hear me okay? Making sure it's working. Great. That's good. Good morning. So I'm going to spend a few minutes sharing with you a couple of data points that highlight the types of homes our region needs and where they might go. Uh, so next, Mike. So this information is the focus of our housing challenge section on the Keys to the Valley website in case you want to find it. And it's likely not news to most of you that our region has a changing population. From 2010 to 2030, we could see an average 100% increase in people above the age of 65. Noted here in the bar graph, you can see um, with the green on the bottom and, in, and a 15% decrease for age groups under 65 noted in the red. For our homes, this means two things. First, we need safe, affordable, and desirable homes for our older residents. And at the same time, we need to provide homes that are appropriate for younger workers. Many older residents want a home they can manage and maintain independence in. And young workers are trending to have no or fewer children, meaning smaller households, while also seeking to be close to desirable amenities that are often found in our village and downtown centers. Thus, for different reasons, both of these age groups are trending to smaller homes with access to more amenities and public infrastructure. This change in population is one of the main drivers for our projections model. With smaller households, more homes are needed for the same number of people. Thus, even though the population projections for 2030 show a population change of 10,000, this projection model also shows a projected 10,000 homes needed, which increases in almost every one of our 67 communities. Although not a crystal ball, this model does give us a sky level picture on likely needed growth in homes just to keep pace. In the last decade, we added approximately 4,000 new homes. This as a reference point. This keeping pace does not take into account the current shortage of homes on the market, especially those are, that are affordable, as Kevin just discussed. Both the housing shortage and lack of affordable housing have been made worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the Vermont Affordable Rental Housing Development Cost Factors Report, the average cost to develop affordable housing was about $228,000 per unit. It would be a lot more now. At that level, it would cost about $2.3 billion to create 10,000 new homes. If we want to be better prepared for the next shock, we need to rely on another more incremental, more adaptive, and ultimately more resilient ways to create new homes. And next, please. The quality of life provided by the homes we live in, not only informed by their access to amenities, as just discussed, but also their safety. With the significant number of older number of homes that are older, many of which contain lead and other hazard, the safety of our residents is not always assured by having a home. For example, in New Hampshire, Grafton, and Sullivan counties, one of every 20 children that's screened shows elevated blood levels. This damage is not reversible with lifelong impacts. On another side of the dice, transportation costs play a significant role in the affordability of our homes. It is suggested that a household pay no more than 45% combined for housing and transportation, and in our region, the average household pays 55% for these costs, 25% of which comes from transportation. Integrated planning with needed infrastructure, such as transportation, will then be essential to our access in the future. Next. At the same time, we need to think about those that are most vulnerable. Based on regional survey results for, for providers of emergency and homes with supportive services, we estimate that uh, they currently serve, from those who responded, 86 individuals. Their wait lists average between 25 to 100 individuals, and their current planned increased capacity is for 10 beds. 
Next. Simply said, I think these numbers speak for themselves. It's not enough. Looking at the, the landscape and planning at the landscape level and thinking about those integrated connections that are appropriate for land, for health, for buildings, and for our natural resources, we did a places for homes analysis to look at where are the suitable places to live. This is the final result of that map, and you can see quite a number of um, other maps on our website with interactive mapping and see your local context. Um, but there are suitable places in every community, um, and, and every community has a role to play in moving this ball forward. Next. So just in summary, before I pass it off to Jason, the homes we need, emergency housing, affordable homes, homes with supportive services, homes with access to internet, to public transit that are walkable, homes that are accessible, smaller homes. And is this a challenge or an opportunity? I'm gonna let Jason say more about whether, which one that is. Off to you, Jason. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, we need, frankly, a lot more homes that look like this uh, in the region. Um, we need them uh, in prices that, that folks can afford and uh, given, given the sort of the prevailing wage rates in the area. Um, our housing providers like Twin Pines, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, they do great work. We need, we need them to continue doing that great work, but it's just simply not enough. Uh, so we need to do more than that. And I think, uh, you know, the developers need, you know, are doing their thing, which is great, but uh, again, not enough. So I think in some cases, um, us homeowners have to become developers too. Um, and we need to create more housing uh, like these, photos, um, smaller homes, single level that might allow better aging in place, for example, um, micro unit apartments, uh, tiny houses, maybe tiny house communities. We need more um, accessory dwelling units. We have an awful lot of older homes uh, that are quite large with maybe one, maybe two folks living in it. Um, those who could become a home share situation or they could be converted into two or three units. We need, we need a lot more of that. And um, we need a lot of uh, what I call incremental, smaller scale infill. Um, and next slide, please. It'll, that'll explain what I mean there a little bit. Um, so as part of the Keys project, um, we, looked at, we looked at what I'm calling infill. We looked at um, three areas in particular, Wilder being one of them here that we're looking at. Um, and, you know, the common thing I hear from towns is, well, there's the village centers full, there's, there's no room for more housing, and we wanted to show that that's not true. Um, so here you're seeing a picture of Wilder um, that's showing some infill development. There's um, the highlighted buildings there. Um, there's a, a combination of different things going on here, but what we wanted to do as an exercise, a completely theoretical exercise, is show that you could fairly easily create 27 new units in this scenario. Um, and, it, and it doesn't really affect the character of the area. Um, and anyway, we, so one of the things we're trying to do here is just help people visualize what change might look like. It doesn't look scary. Um, and, and we're also trying to prioritize focusing that development in areas that are served by infrastructure, maybe where you could walk down to the store, uh, get the bus, go to work, that sort of thing. And so, um, next slide, please. Um, you know, as, as you've heard, um, the status quo isn't, isn't working. Um, so, you know, we need to continue doing the things that we are doing well. We have to look at other, other ways of doing it. And so we, we looked at a number of different models. Uh, you're going to hear from some of them uh, here very, very soon. But um, in the Keys project, you know, there's a whole lot more information in there. We wanted to throw out some, some models or some examples from away, from other places that, uh, and sometimes not away, sometimes they're local examples. Um, things that we might want to look at and, um, and either 
expand or um, and try to try to see if it'll fit for our region. A um, couple of examples here, or actually the one example here, Minnesota Equity Fund um, or something similar, uh, a re some sort of a regional public-private uh, fund that could help to uh, basically generate money and invest in housing for, for the area. And, and you'll hear a little bit more about thinking about that here in our neck of the woods. But um, in this case, in Minnesota, this fund has, has you know, helped out uh, rehabilitating and creating homes for uh, many, many folks. Um, and then you're going to hear about in just a few minutes about um, some other examples that we're thinking about in the area. Um, in particular, uh, in my mind anyway, one of the things that's interesting, very interesting to me is like the, the Montpelier Accessory Dwelling Unit uh, pilot project, for example. And so that and a few others, um, you will hear from some other folks on that soon. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so it's a daunting problem, and uh, but I think one of the things we want to try to highlight is that there are there are relatively easy things that we can do about it. Um, and so one of those is regulatory reform. Um, we know that you know the, getting their, getting your permits sometimes can be an issue, and there's definitely some easy things that we can all do, uh, or our communities can work towards to uh, help address it or at least prevent. Um, you know, problems that aren't necessary. And so we're, we're looking at a number of things such as, um, you know, density standards, um, dimensional standards, parking, and, and some other, other sort of easier fixes. And um, so the Keys Project has a lot of information there. And we also do point to some other studies out there in the area that uh, also help with that. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so one, one simple example, um, and there's more in there, but um, is basically a lot of zoning doesn't, uh, the standards don't reflect what's on the ground today. Um, you know, you couldn't build the, the village of Chester, for example, given uh, if you're starting from scratch based on their existing regulations. So what we're really suggesting is one simple fix is just making sure that your, uh, the density standards um, meet what's on the ground today. And um, by allowing that, uh, you're basically allowing, generally speaking, for more density. And if smaller, all things being equal, if smaller is cheaper, uh, you know, you'll be able to create hopefully more affordable units, um, hopefully, as a result of that. Next slide, please. And here's, here's an example, uh, you know, if you're if your community looks something like that in that picture, then you know maybe your standards should look something like that uh, right next to it. And so you know, again, just trying to fit the the standards um, to what's on the ground today will help uh, to some extent. Um, and next slide, please. So that's really all you know we wanted to share with you, hitting highlights. Um, but more importantly, uh, we think it's important to hear from some of the um, some, some examples out there. And so, um, Mike, I guess back to you to, to, to get that started. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin and Jason and, and Olivia. The, um, you know, Keys is getting a lot of attention across Vermont and across New Hampshire um, because so many people are ready to act and, and they're looking for where, where they can make a difference. They're wondering how they can get engaged. And, and so I think we're pretty fortunate to have a plan that shows all these different ways that different stakeholders can, can act, that we can become people who are creating homes. That it's not someone else's problem to solve, but it's ours. And, and that we have the power to do it and ways to do it. So thank you for that great work. Um, so as you mentioned, let's take a look at some of the living examples of some of the strategies that, that you just described. Um, and as we're going along, we'll be putting links in the chat to highlight where each of these particular examples fits within the overall keys plan. Um, and, and so our first example is gonna be a group that's taking action right now um, called the Corporate Council. And the Corporate Council is, is comprised of the major employers in our area. And, and this group came together because they're committed to the long-term vitality of our communities. Um, Clay Adams chairs that Corporate Council and he's gonna tell us about an emerging effort to support home affordability. So I'll pass it over to you, Clay. 
Thanks, Mike. Uh, and thank you, Jason, Olivia, and Kevin. Your work really frames the problem and suggests uh, solutions. It is really striking to me that we're going to need 10,000 more homes by 2030, uh, two and a half times what we've done in the past decade. And I guess that's why we're all here. As Mike said, uh, the Corporate Council is a group of two dozen businesses and nonprofits based in the Upper Valley. Uh, our membership includes most of the large organizations and collectively a very high percentage of the Upper Valley employment base. Uh, three years ago, we made a commitment to address the shortfall of affordable workforce housing in our region. This has included providing financial resources, speaking at planning board and city council meetings, and overall bringing greater visibility to this increasingly acute problem. As part of this, earlier this year, we retained Evernorth to conduct a feasibility study to explore the possibility of creating a fund dedicated to development housing that supports our current and future employees, focusing on those who make between $16 and $25 per hour, or the equivalent of 60 to 80% of the region's average median income. While the concept of the fund is still very much on the drawing board, we want to share this as an example of how some area employers are thinking about the problem of workforce housing. Now, it's now my pleasure to introduce Nancy Owens, the president of Evernorth. She'll take a few minutes to describe Evernorth and the work they're doing uh, on the corporate council's behalf. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for that introduction, Clay. And um, Evernorth is a, a community development organization and we are working across Northern New England and we were just created last summer, so you may not recognize our name, but we were created through the merger of two longstanding organizations that you may be familiar with, Housing Vermont based in Burlington and Northern New England Housing Investment Fund out of Portland, Maine. And together, uh, we've raised over a billion dollars from local and regional banks and invested those funds to create over 13,000 affordable housing units in um, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And we also finance um, growing businesses in low-income areas to support new jobs. So in addition to financing projects, we are also a real estate developer and have developed over 6,000 apartments in Vermont. And in this region, the Upper Valley, we regularly work with Twin Pines Housing Trust, um, and we're also currently financing the new apartments at Heater Landing uh, that the uh, Lebanon Housing Authority is, is starting construction soon on. And so we really, um, we love this work and we love working with communities to help them to address the need for capital, housing and jobs. And that's why we were excited to accept the challenge that the Corporate Council put before us and, and, and ask this question of what, what can employers do to invest um, their own resources, time and, and money to foster the development of workforce housing in the region. Um, we, as, as Clay said, we're working on a feasibility study. We set up a process to gather some information about the needs and opportunities for new housing. And certainly all the work of the Keys to the Valley have been really um, um, informative. Um, and then uh, we uh, evaluated various lending and investing strategies with the steering committee to understand their goals and also gathered information talking to dozens of people around the region, um, including uh, employers, developers, um, municipal officials from both New Hampshire and Vermont, real estate professionals, and the planning community. And so the idea that we are working on is to raise capital that developers can use to finance mixed income rental housing. And this patient equity-like uh, capital or loan capital will be available in exchange for setting below market rents for some of the apartments in um, their properties. And we've spent a lot of time sort of doing financial models about the loan fund, looking at various structures, talking with potential investors about, about their needs and what they're looking for, and looking at the sample development performance to understand how that would all come together. Um, we've drawn a few conclusions that we can share with you, and we're, as we said, still in the process. But uh, as Clay said, we're really, um, just to be clear, we're focused on, on rental housing and on um, really housing with a priority for people earning between 16 and $25 an hour. Um, we're looking again at a geographic solution. So we're looking at financing developments throughout the Upper Valley region. And uh, there was some talk about location and how that matters. We, were we are interested in um, a location that's accessible to services, jobs, internet, water and sewer infrastructure. But we need to weigh the cost and benefits of developing in those very core towns that are um, where land is a little bit more expensive, but the amenities and the jobs are very close versus working in the towns where folks um, 
are outside of the immediate employment center and, and are still, but still within a reasonable commuting distance. But we're, we're looking at those options. Um, we're looking to finance both new construction, so we're adding those new units that we've been talking about, but also um, interested in the acquisition of existing rental housing where we're able to preserve affordability and really prevent rent escalation, because that, that's also occurring. Um, we think that right now is a terrific time to be doing this work and making investments, that there's a great opportunity to leverage um, a lot of new federal programs and resources that are coming in um, to our states and in terms of recovery um, programs and funds. And that leveraging, leveraging these local resources with even existing programs like the various tax credit programs that are available in both states and through the federal government are also is a, is a strategy we want to explore. Um, also just want to say like, this is not, um, this is not going to work for every developer or every transaction, this new funding source. Um, it needs to be, uh, it, it, it's, we need to work early with the developers to structure the loan capital for them in a way that works for them and helps them achieve their goals and also works for the investor and helps them achieve the goals of affordability. So it's going to be really important to work with developers at the earliest stages of their financing so we can work together to structure the transaction and, and meet all of our goals and get that affordability impact that we're really looking for. So our next steps we're actively um, wanting to speak to developers and towns and landowners and others who um, can help us to create that pipeline of opportunities and have those conversations. And also we're, we'll be engaging with, um, with the employers and talking more about what does that investment look like and looking for commitments. So that's where we're headed. Thanks. Wow, uh, thanks Nancy and, and thank you Clay. Um, it's pretty exciting that, that people are looking at you know, our employers looking, how can we be, direct, be directly invested, partner with our, our local developers? Um, it's ways we can do things together that enable things that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and it's reasonable, you know, it, we're hearing about those kind of partnerships. Um, we ask what, what might towns do? And so Matt, As Matt Osborne from Hartford's here to tell us about a zoning change that they're working on and, and why they're doing that. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning. I'm Matt Osborne. I'm a town planner for the town of Hartford. I've worked for Hartford for 24 years. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a recent uh, zoning change um, that we made in Hartford. Um, back in 2018 and 19, um, we were working on the update of the town plan. Um, we held a series of community forums and we heard a, reoccur a reoccurring theme from the public that we should look at creating more opportunities for mixed use development, which is residential and commercial development in the same building, and to rethink the strict segregation of uses in many of our commercial zoning districts. Following adoption of the town plan, um, we received inquiries from several property owners looking to create residential and mixed use development in two areas of Hartford. These areas did not permit residential or mixed use development. Uh, those areas were a, a sizable commercial zoning district on Route 4 in Quichi and a much smaller area at the intersection of Route 4 and 5 in White River Junction. Um, starting with Quichi, um, the slide we have here is, is a, a land use map of Quichi and the Highway Commercial Zoning District, um, which consists of 54 acres and was, a, again, a straight commercial zoning district that did not allow mixed use or residential development. And it's located at the junction of Route 4 in Waterman Hill and Coochie Heartland Road. Um, it's just up the hill from the Coochie Cover Bridge in the heart of Coochie Village. Um, the district also included West Gilson Avenue, um, home of the Mid-Vermont Christian School, and several vacant parcels. Um, the proposal included creating a new zoning district, the Kuchi Commercial Residential District. The proposed district would make single unit and two unit dwellings permitted uses and multi-unit dwellings and mixed use development conditional uses. 
Um, since there is town water and town sewer in the area, um, densities would be up to 12.4 um, units per acre. Um, with the zoning change, there would be increased opportunities for housing and mixed use development near the heart of Gucci Village. And going to the next slide, um, on the east side of Route 5 by the intersection with Route 4, there's a five parcels that combine make up just two and a quarter acres. Um, the area was zoned industrial commercial, it did not allow um, residential or mixed use development. And we uh, proposed creating a new zoning district called the Highway Commercial Residential. Um, it would make single unit, two unit, um, a permitted use and multi-unit and, and mixed use. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, multi-unit dwellings and, and mixed use development would be a conditional use. Um, again, we have town water and town sewer available and we would allow um, densities up to 12 and a half units per acre. Um, and again, with the, um, the zoning change, um, it would create more opportunities for, for housing. Um, our process, um, last year over a period of several months, um, staff had discussions with property owners who were interested in either mixed use or residential development. Staff met frequently amongst ourselves um, and developed recommendations for the changes. Um, once we agreed on the details, we scheduled workshops with the Planning Commission last fall. Um, the Planning Commission supported the changes and the next step was to uh, present the proposed changes to the public. Um, in January and February, we held three community meetings, um, which resulted in, in support for the changes. So we next moved forward to the adoption process and scheduled public hearings with the Planning Commission and Select Board. Having public support and lacking opposition on um, the Planning Commission and Select Board voted unanimously to approve the zoning amendments. Um, the changes became effective in April and they provide opportunities for housing that were not previously available. And we're hopeful that these changes will result in, in more housing in Hartford in the coming years. Um, lessons that we learned from this, um, there's no such thing as perfect zoning. Um, as planners, we need to constantly work to adapt zoning to the changing needs in our communities. Um, we have a serious housing crisis um, and we need solutions. Um, fine tuning zoning is one option, um, but community support is really key. Um, next steps for us in, in Hartford, um, we're currently working on the update of our housing chapter of our town plan. Um, we're going to be working with the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. Um, we're excited about working to improve housing opportunities in Hartford. Um, at the same time, we'll also be looking at other commercial zoning districts um, to consider opportunities to create more mixed use and residential development. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I, that is great to hear that you've got this public support and you've got people who want to create the homes and businesses that they can walk to and, and get around in their village, or get around in a village. It's pretty, pretty impressive. And, uh, and commend you all for taking that, taking the lead and moving on that. Um, it's one of the dozens of ways that, that you know, are included in the, in the keys package for how towns can be involved in making it easier for the creation of homes. Um, and, you know, we can also ask, talk about earlier, what can residents do? What can organizations do to welcome newcomers and to help people remain in, in the communities they love? Um, you know, the, it's not all about building new stuff. And Deanna Jones from the Thompson Senior Center is here to tell us about an approach um, that can use resources we already have. Hi everyone, um, my name is Deanna Jones. I'm the executive director for the Thompson Senior Center in Woodstock, Vermont. Um, and excuse me, I've come down with this bad summer cold and um, I'll try to 
make myself squeak through this um, for you. Um, I also have with me uh, Shari Borzakowski, who is our resource coordinator at the Thompson um, and very well versed in the Thompson Home Share program as well. Um, if I start a coughing fit, <laughs> she'll be on. Um, so just a little bit of background about the Thompson Senior Center and who we are. Um, we're a multi-purpose senior center um, located in, in Woodstock, Vermont. We serve about 1,500 older adults annually uh, with programs, wellness activities, transportation, home delivered meals, and a wide variety of um, resources to age well at home and in your community. Four years ago, <clears throat> we implemented our Aging at Home program as a part of our strategic plan in response to the need and desire of our community um, to have one number to call for any type of Aging at Home support. We offer vetted referrals um, for any type of need from caregivers and housekeepers um, to legal services and home modifications. Um, and as I mentioned, Shari is um, with us and she's our resource coordinator um, for that type of service. Um, one need um, we've seen repeatedly over the years is the desire for folks to remain in their homes and community, but also being overwhelmed by the basic tasks of staying in their home. Um, things like lawn mowing or snow shoveling, but even sometimes just the worry of being alone at night. And we often hear the desire um, to stay in one's own community, but without the ability to downsize or move to a more manageable property within their community. And this is what led um, us to talk about home share, um, along with you know, many community efforts related to housing in our area. Um, we feel that home share addresses two key issues affecting our community. Um, affordable housing, of course, and um, the large number of community residents living alone in houses that may be difficult for them to afford and maintain, and um, or the desire for some assistance or companionship in their home. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so using the proven model developed by HomeShare Vermont, our goal is um, to offer a shared housing program that matches homeowners in the community with community members seeking housing. The matching prof process emphasizes mutual safety and compatibility of the homeowner and home sharer. We've implemented a clear set of procedures, including background checks, applicant interviews and reference checks, and are using forms adapted from the Home Share Vermont model to ensure that homeowners and home shares in the program are secure and compatible in their matching. I think it's also important to point out that we don't in any way see this as a live-in caregiver type of situation, which is, is something that comes up um, often. It's, it's not a, a around-the-clock caregiver type of role. Um, in any way, and, and we do make that clear um, to those who are interested. So the timing um, of this, where we're at, um, well, we were ready to kick this off last March, COVID delayed our start, and we've now restarted with sort of a soft pilot. We're not yet recruiting broadly. Um, we, we seem to have more interest, obviously, from people looking for a place than those who are ready to share their home. But we are following up with all of those who have expressed interest over the past year and a half or so. And we're reaching out to participants who might be home sharing candidates. We're including information in our newsletter about this resource and um, ready to start um, making those matches as the right people come along. Um, so that's where we're at um, in our project, and we'd welcome any questions, either Shari or I, after this presentation. And thank you for including us in this important discussion. Thanks, Deanna, and, and thanks for powering through a summer cold. <laughs> yeah. uh, I hope you feel better soon. <laughs> Come and see you. my now. Uh, it, it's, it, it's really good to hear that you're getting this effort going. Um, and, and clearly the need is out there. 
or the demand is out there. You know, people want to, um, they want to be able to meet their own needs and they want to benefit the community by their continued presence and by creating space for a new neighbor. And, and it's pretty exciting that Thompson's enabling that to happen. Um, are there other ways that we can support the use of existing structures to create more affordable places to live? Um, there are. And, uh, and Paul Mortarano from, the, from Wind and Windsor Housing Trust has helped some of that happen in the end of last year. So Paul's here today to talk, tell us about a, a rehabilitation program they did that turned some dilapidated places into nice places to live at affordable rents. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Moderano. I'm, I'm the Multifamily Rental Improvement Program Coordinator at the Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust. Um, and basically, yeah, this 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 program uh, took some. I don't see any slides up or on my screen. So, oh yeah. So they, uh, so basically, the re rehousing recovery program was called. It was it was it seems to be like a co you know kind of a coalition of a lot of things that have been spoken about today of public funding uh, which came down through the CARES Act uh, stimulus package into the state, you know, it made its way through HUD and the ACCD and then the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development sort of wrote this uh, grant for which provided up to $30,000 per unit to bring vacant rental units in Vermont up to, up to code. And some of the things that were, you know, were already mentioned is, you know, housing shortages and, and uh, you know, we have some of the oldest housing in the country, actually. So not only do we have a shortage, but uh, the housing that we have, it, a lot of it has a, what we would, you know, refer to as deferred maintenance. Um, and so, you know, this this really helped. I noticed it says there's 70 units, uh, are 70 units, about 70 units in the Wyndham and Windsor counties are in the pipeline around and so the, so the 2020 money is still uh, available. We got an extension so that people could commit to completing these projects. So hopefully, you know, with, by the end of it all, we'll have more, you know, more than 70 units created in the, in the, in the, in, you know, the two counties. And uh, I, sh just to show one example, if you guys would uh, hit the next slide. Uh, so this is this is one of the examples, and as as we were showing in you know uh, houses and communities, and there is a, a number of challenges, and, you know, and one of them is that you know a house is basically you know kind of a, a little let me wax poetic here for a bit, but it's a member of the community as well, you know, and this particular project is is right in, on Route 44, which cuts right through uh, Windsor and it goes up to West Windsor and into a Scutney. And then down into the town of Windsor. So, and the hospital was close by, and you know, but it's also you know has a lot of great uh, amenities around. It's close to schools, close to recreation areas. Uh, hiking trails are there, and you know, so there. But it was really kind of a blight, you know, to the neighborhood, looking the way it is. And so, being a member of the community, uh, if you show the next slide, there was some. Uh, it, 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 the, the property owner here, who was a private property owner, uh, just rehabbed. We provided a $30,000 grant. I believe he spent per unit well over $70,000 per unit. So, you know, so the money coming from the federal government, we provided it to the private owners, and the private owners have also, you know, really pitched in to, to, to help this project along. And the key was is that they had to rent to to folks from the what the continuum of care. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but that's that's um, basically the the main objective was to try to house individuals who are currently residing in in the motels. Uh, they have nowhere the state funded motel program, which operates mainly in the winter. This is uh, you know one of the tricks to that one. But so here's you know here's some of the work in progress. Uh, next next slide, so you can see there's a worker in the corner there. He, he all new um, all new systems in this, all new insulation. So there's energy efficiency here. Uh, the systems are, are brand new. The owners and uh, are paying for heat, electric, 
and hot water according to like the how HUD gross um, gross rent they need to pay for heat, hot water, and electric. And uh, in in some cases they can either pay or or reduce the rent. And uh, but here we have all new systems. So whoever pays for the heat in this house is going to have a you know a bit of a break just for the energy efficiency and and things like that, which is also sort of a a, a goal in Vermont. Um, and so so here it is. Uh, can I get to the next slide, please? That's some of the stuff. And so here's a completed you know, and this is the brand new apartment that uh, you know some some examples of it that that we see. And you know, I know personally about some of these units. Uh, there were people that, you know, to plug the continuum of care here, uh, there are, you know, people that have had struggling, I've been in the community working in different, you know, different aspects of housing and homelessness. And, and so I know that there are people that were in the community having trouble finding housing. And in, in fact, one of the people that showed up on a lease, I won't, I can't mention where or when or who, but one of the people that did show up on a lease somewhere was actually a person that I, I personally knew who could not get into, you know, housing for one reason or another. And, you know, a private landlord was, you know, said, hey, you know, I got to do this. I'm taking a chance. And he was able to take a chance on on the on this person and who now has a home. And uh, so and a nice one at that. So it's um, so these are, you know, these are some of the. The, the things that we have and so some of what you know what I've seen I think that you know this is this rehousing program is just a great example of public uh, and private teamwork and uh, you know some of the other challenges we heard today are you know like transportation and things like that I think we can also agree that are, you know everything is needed we need a real holistic approach to to solve this challenge so that's it. Well, thanks, Paul. The um, it's great to hear that you got landlords who are I think still have some in the pipeline um, from the 2020 money, and, and I think you told me that there's a, a line of people who would love to do uh, to do more or, or to also you know turn other empty places into livable spaces um, if there's more funds available. So um, I know our I know that went into our budget. Uh, in Vermont, and um, and hopefully the legislation to enable that to happen is going to work out pretty soon too. Um, I looked at the legislators to call on work on that, um, and I'd go a little uh, little further. You know, this is it's great when you can um, have the sort of public funding with a with somebody who's got the time and the skills uh, and you know to to do something. But some people might need a little more help, and um, with things like the design work and getting permits and financing and how do you manage a contractor and, and manage the project and and then even once you've got the place made how do you you know find a tenant how do you do uh the lease up arrangements and and how do you do the the property management in an ongoing way um and and so for those of us like me who don't have all those skills um uh you know, Vermont State Housing Agency is, is trying out a pilot that might help us out. And, and Tyler Moss is here to tell us about a, an ADU pilot. So uh, all yours, Tyler. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here today. Um, it is Vermont State Housing Authority, uh, just for the record. Um, but- uh, I might um, you take up. to go. Hello? I'll wait for that background noise to, okay, yes. So um, I've, I've also uh, come down with uh, something uh, called for the for the past year, and it's a called uh, emergency rental assistance. So forgive me if I explode at any moment, um, but I'm here today not to talk about rental assistance, uh, which is very exciting. I'm here to talk about uh, accessory dwelling units and the Montpelier ADU program. Uh, the program started in uh, August of 2019, and by March of 2020, we had one project completed and occupied, two projects under construction, and three in the permitting phase. 
around the middle of March, things changed drastically and uh, homeowners uh, became uh, more reticent uh, about sharing their home and property. Uh, contractors became impossible to find and as we know the world changed so we have uh, it's slowed down a lot over the past year so it's not a, a good example year of the type of uh, growth that uh, an, an ADU program with uh, you know dedicated personnel and funds can and you know help to create uh, accessory dwelling units in communities uh, but we are back on track um, and the reason I have uh, a, a slide up here mostly showing the money is because some people think of the ADUs they see a, a television show where someone built an ADU in their backyard out of pallets for five thousand dollars and they're like great I want one of those and that's not reality right we know all know that construction projects take twice as long and cost twice as much as you think no matter if you're uh, building a freestanding ADU or if you're renovating your bathroom so um, that's a lot of the reality check we initially set out and had, you know, when we meant, uh, started advertising about the program, we had, you know, 50 people called in the first two weeks and we were blown away. And as we went and started meeting with these people, it, it, it got down to those five or so that we were, you know, in the very beginning. So it is almost a 10 to one ratio of people who really want to do this and people who can do this. So it's, it's important to know that um, ADUs, uh, do cost a substantial amount of money. Construction is expensive and unfortunately it's only getting worse. Um, we uh, knew this going into it and so we knew that we'd need a significant amount of money to, to get this pilot up and running and we decided to go with uh, the most restrictive funding possible because I love a challenge and we accessed the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, which uh, gracefully, I hope nobody's on here. Josh is going <laughs> to wring my neck. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, it was uh, it was the best way to find a, a big chunk of money. However, as we know, that comes with uh, a lot of restrictions. That uh, program, that the community developed block, uh, block grant, did provide up to twenty thousand dollar grants to homeowners upon completion of the project. And that was based on a reimbursement of 50% uh, of the cost. So if they had only spent $20,000 on the unit, they would only be eligible for a $10,000 uh, reimbursement grant. Um, however, if they spent $40,000, they'd get up to 20 and on up, they'd still be stuck at the $20,000. But that, uh, is a significant incentive for homeowners. Uh, and we find that there's a certain psychology of an incentive that really brings people to the table to say, oh, right, there's money available. I've been thinking about doing this project for a long time. So it's really important for communities who are thinking about uh, creating ADU projects to have uh, some, some incentives on the table other than just saying, we've made zoning easier. Um, that's that that's one thing and that's great. And Vermont has done a, a a really good job of making some statewide changes and a lot of lo local uh, municipalities have made uh, even even large, bigger changes they have to it's either it's either uh, the state level or or more but um, having that having some incentives available was uh, important we also found that people needing money up front was important so uh, we're, the Vermont State Housing Authority put their skin in the game and we invested, uh, we started the ADU Enable Loan Program uh, that has a $100,000 budget and provides a loan of up to $10,000 at the onset of the program. And that's a 0% interest loan uh, that um, has a five-year term. So people are able to pay that off. It's 166 bucks a month for five years and change in the last month. Um, so um, that was able, that was a, a big incentive for people to get that little bit of money to, to get going. And also having, um, you know, my, myself and uh, we had one uh, admin helping out to, for people getting, getting ready to, um, to plan for these projects was very important because people have a lot of questions, you know, they don't understand all the zoning requirements and their, um, and each town is different. So it's something that is, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily jump, you know, transfer from town to town. We started this, uh, I started, or, or 
started out working with uh, the Brattleboro Area Affordable Housing in their Apartments and Homes program. And Brattleboro had been doing this for a while when I started, so they were really uh, just accepting of, of ADUs and, and pushing them through as quickly as possible, waiving everything they could just to get these things built because they knew how, how well uh, they worked in our community down there. And so we, uh, you know, had by the time I left, I think they created about 54 units down there in over the course of whatever it was, <laughs> uh, 15 years or something. Um, so that was, that. that's where we started out, moved it up to Montpelier. The city of Montpelier also uh, threw in a, a grant of $50,000. And that was um, more of a flexible, uh, fund because it came out of the city, uh, their housing trust fund. So they were able to fund part of what the community, uh, the CDBG money did not, uh, which was freestanding units as well as additions because uh, our program only allowed for internal conversions, ADUs. Um, so, uh, I mean, to be funded with the grant from, from uh, the, uh, Department of Housing. So, so that was uh, important to have that because a lot of people did want to um, do the freestanding, see those pictures in Dwell Magazine or whatever, and they're like, oh, that's what I want in my backyard. They don't realize that that ADU cost $300,000. Um, but uh, that's 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 what people people like. They 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 go for that. So that was some some flexible funding from the city of Montpelier, and and they've been great at helping to push these things through to get these these programs these uh, these uh, projects started. Um, I guess we can move to the to the next slide. Um, these were this is uh, well it's one and a half projects uh, in my slides, but uh, as you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, uh, starting in the wrong place as usual, they, uh, this was a, a home in Montpelier. A uh, homeowner had been there for a while and had thought to build an ADU to uh, you know, supplement the income as in retirement was coming. Um, so we started the project, and this one again had to. Uh, we had to tap into that Montpelier money because it was a change of footprint. And you can see the way it bumped out from the side of the house right there. They actually took the window, the bay window that was on the side of the house, and put it on the front of the ADU. And the upper left-hand corner is the interior of uh, that unit. There's a, a bedroom off of that, and a the uh, on the left-hand side, and then also a, a bathroom there and in the basement, uh, they've actually created sort of this, uh, uh, an office workspace. When COVID hit, everything changed. And uh, this woman who thought that she was going to be renting this out for supplemental income uh, actually ended up moving into the ADU so that her daughter who had lost her housing, uh, her daughter, her daughter and family to a couple of children, um, needed a place to go. They also suddenly were not able to afford their rent and uh, didn't know what to do, were losing their housing. So they moved into the main house and the uh, and mom moved into the ADU. And I think that's just a great example of uh, how ADUs are flexible, how they could go from uh, being a rental unit to being something that you lived in. Um, and here, I will, I will just, freak everybody out, out here by saying and also potentially a short-term rental. Um, so uh, also up in the upper right hand corner you can see that's that was a brand new project that was just one that's a, a little more of that modern flair that, that people see that was a conversion over a garage didn't have a, a great chance to fit a, uh, a before and after in into that but um, on the next slide you can see these are uh, some of our active projects that we have now, and it shows the some of the variations on on uh, on ADUs. And like the one on the upper left is a freestanding that was an old uh, you know garage detached uh, dwelling from the house already there, sort of had everything in place, uh, had electricity, did not have plumbing, but um, now the upper part and part of the lower area will be turned into uh, a living area. 
Um, and then on the right, upper right, you know, there was a basement, which has been turned into a, a nice walkout basement. Uh, so that uh, was existing space. And uh, in the lower right, you see that there, that uh, yellow house on the left-hand side there, that was actually sort of um, almost an in-law type area. It had a bedroom, a little uh, sitting room and a bathroom. And so that was something that um, was very ready to become an ADU by, by sectioning it off from the house. Um, the way our project worked because of the uh, CDBG money was that we had to also be within under the 80% uh, AMI. Um, that could, the, we had two ways of determining eligibility. One was that the owner could uh, be eligible uh, at the onset of the program and then they would we'd meet our beneficiary uh, in, in that way. If the owner was above uh, the 80% of AMI, then they would need to re uh, rent to someone who was below 80%. That, uh, that el uh, eligibility was determined. At, I don't know if that's me. I think, <laughs> okay. I think the reason going to help us out by, by muting Alicia if she can. Okay. Uh, it's not allowing you to mute. So hopefully we're okay. Um, so yeah, so anyway, the uh, um, eligibility was uh, uh, for the for the renter is also determined at the onset. So uh, that was one thing that we wanted to get in there, so that if the person uh, did go above eighty percent AMI, right, they didn't lose their housing. Um, so uh, we'd lastly encourage people to uh, get get more income from their employment uh, at. at and it, you know, as they as they stay in one place, if it did turn over, then we would uh, do initial we did an eligibility um, determination at that time as well. Um, one of the things that uh, we did, and at, literally on March sixteenth of twenty twenty, I was set to meet with uh, the uh, head of the architectural drafting program at Vermont Tech and his class at the uh, the unit in the upper left hand that freestanding garage structure uh, because we had worked on a par partnership um, with um, with v Vermont Tech to have their students do free design for the class. What they would do is come in, do an initial visit, uh, come and then speak with the homeowner about their ideas, come back with a plan, to talk with the homeowner, here's what we're thinking. The homeowner would change, make some changes. They would go back and do a final and then do a presentation in the classroom, actually in front of the homeowner. So the, the homeowner would end up getting free design uh, drawings and specs, as well as, uh, you know, the chance to work with all these students and the students would get real world experience working within the constraints of a budget and a, a real project. And uh, the community would, would would get a home and there'd be a renter. And so there was just so many wins across the board. Um, <clears throat> I got a, an email at 6.30 in the morning on uh, <clears throat> March 16th uh, saying, I don't think we can make it today. Um, so, uh, so that has changed. However, we had started that with, uh, based on uh, working with the Career Center, which is also, I think, uh, in some towns, they call it uh, the Tech Center in high schools. So a lot of these areas have that, and I think it's a resource that people need to consider for free design work. Um, uh, it getting students involved is also helps people stay in the community because uh, these people who are taking architecture courses, right, they all think they're going to be designing libraries and hospitals and museums and most of them are going to be doing uh, internal conversions of homes because that's where the work that's where a lot of the work is. So finding finding that, uh, getting students interested in it also helps keep people in Vermont, which, um, which is something that will contribute to uh, to our state and uh, but then again more people staying means more housing needed so um, I know we'll probably have a lot of questions this is a very brief overview of the ADU program and I'm happy to answer questions at any point. Thanks Tyler. Um, I, I think the creative partnership that you just described with with students um, you know and and working with homeowners, um, treating each case as an individual, you know, wh what do they need? How are they gonna meet the requirements? Um, that, that's, that's the sort of creativity that, that can make something like this work. And as we transition to questions, you know, I, I, 
I noticed there was one in the chat um, about this saying, well, what's, what's the similar program in New Hampshire? And, uh, and I, I kind of put that back, um, it, you know, is the, or the thought, I guess I'd throw out that maybe we don't need to wait for a state program. We've already talked on this call about local investment. We've talked about um, the, the partnerships we have locally in communities. What can towns do? Where's their property? Where are their homes? Where are their interested landlords? Uh, you know, property owners. So maybe we can meet a lot of the requirements by being creative ourselves. The, um, and, and I appreciate all these examples. So I'm gonna, we had a pretty active chat, uh, we'll call it chat storm, but chat interaction happening. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is our, our time to, to bring some of those questions up. Um, some will be answered by presenters um, and, and uh, you know, we've got the slide up with everybody's contact information. Um, we'll be sending out these, uh, these slides later again, so that'll be available to everyone. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll look at some of the questions that have come, come along recently. Um, one was really, I, I guess, about in talking about involving community, the role of second homes. And, um, and Kevin, you've talked a little bit about this, so, so maybe you'd want to start with a, what are the roles of second homes in our communities? How can we engage people who might be owners of second homes in being part of of you know having a vital community and, and meeting our housing needs for everybody. Um, so second homes are you know are, are a traditional part of many of our communities. It's not a bad thing. Like like anything else, you know, you have to do things in moderation. And so conversion of existing primary units to second homes uh, has issues in terms that it takes out housing stock, especially if it's being converted as just as a short term rental, because then it's um, its valuation goes up, which drives up neighbors' property uh, values as well. And it's, um, it's not necessarily contributing to the local economy. It's, it's uh, maybe just be kind of withdrawing cash from the local economy. And so those things are important to, to figure out. There are taxation ways. Uh, we think that people can deal with that, um, that kind of discourage uh, conversion or tax things at higher rates. If you're going to treat it like a hotel, well, maybe we should tax you like a hotel. Um, but there's also stuff where a bunch of those units uh, could have ADUs in them, uh, where somebody's living there all the time, and maybe that helps out. You know, you're a, a landowner from away, and you'd like somebody to be watching your place a little bit. And so there are opportunities there in, in those second homes. Uh, to potentially create additional units that are that are useful for our, our residents. So I would I would just like to jump in there for quickly, if possible, because that is something that I've been pushing for. Because um, there are so many second homes in in uh, Vermont, and they already are uh, vacation homes, right? So they are they are being rented out. So we are we'd be turning them into uh, we'd be creating housing in our community by allowing people to to turn them into ADUs. And that's something I've been pushing for, for a long time. And it, 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 it's, it's a contentious subject, how to, how to work with that. But we know we can't keep uh, the tourists out of Vermont. We need them. And uh, if we can let them build our housing for us, thumbs up in my book. Thanks, Tyler. And thanks, Kevin. Um, a loop back, there's a couple of questions that have come in around um, the role of regional collaboration. Um, and, and one of them around, uh, you know, the, the planning commission saying, hey, can we ask each town to, to set a target for what they might do over the next decade or so? Uh, another question earlier on about the fact that, you know, if we're trying to do this one by one, town by town, um, you know, we're, we're not likely to make much, it's not likely to be much different than it has been. Um, so how can we, how can we collaborate and have this sort of collective bargaining power that, uh, that does enable us to empower workforce, um, to negotiate, you know, for supplies, for, um, to, to actually have a kind of shared plan. And, um, and so, uh, you know, Jason, Olivia, Kevin, uh, you know, I'll maybe start with you again, as you represent the planning commissions, um, you know, where can we go with the, with the keys to the Valley that does help us work regionally and therefore, you know, meet this as a regional, a regional challenge rather than struggling on our own. Sure. Um, and, and I can't see everybody out there. So Jason and Olivia jump on, 
too. Um, the first off, our project uh, somewhat has it right now, and we'll be refining it with the new census numbers uh, later. Uh, but there is the idea that each town has a target number of affordable units, um, and we can kind of suss that out of the data out there. Um, however, you know, in small towns, it's a very small number. In bigger towns, it's a bigger number. Uh, we also believe that you kind of, you can't shift really your housing responsibility. You can't kind of go, well, you know, we're an expensive town, so people shouldn't live here. They should all go live in the cheap town and come work in our town. Well, because that's uh, morally reprehensible, right? So let's not do that. Uh, however, there are lots of places where there are areas right on the edge of towns where, you know, something we may need a sewer line to cross a town over, or, or maybe the town's going to plow over into this weird little road that, that's in another town. And so there's, there's lots of places where towns should be talking, and towns should be talking <laughs> to each other all the time anyways. Uh, but uh, I don't know if Olivia and Jason have more stuff out there. Before Olivia and Jason jump in, uh, Allison's got her hand up, and um, and lots of people pointed that out to me. Thank you for helping. It's hard to see us all, each of us. So, um, Allison, if you'd like to go ahead if on this issue too, and then and we'll get Jason and Olivia to, to partner with you. Well, thanks. This has been terrific. Um, uh, thank you all. It's so great to see so many faces I've come to respect and admire, and this many great minds being brought to bear on this crisis. Uh, it can't be a crisis for too long if all of you were addressing it. So uh, I, my, my first question uh, is, and I just have to say, it's the most exciting thing to have $190 million in our budget this year dedicated to housing, a whole range of housing. We have never spent that much money on housing. So money is coming our way, uh, which is really thrilling, uh, as all, most of you know. Um, but I had two kind of funny, just specific questions. One is um, to Nancy and Clay, and maybe I was distracted when Oliver brought me more breakfast, but is there a goal for the Ever North uh, and corporate council? Is there a goal for that financing fund? That's question one. And question two is a kind of slightly awkward one, but as you know, I live in Woodstock and our tipping point is getting very scary about the number of seasonal residents. And, you know, we, we have a notion of a healthy amount of families should pay for housing, 30%. Nobody should pay more than 30% for housing. So what's a healthy tipping point for a town in terms of number of seasonal residents for a town? I, I, I put that out there because I think it's actually something we need to address. Um, because our towns are being gutted by two challenges, particularly the gold towns, seasonal residents and short-term rentals. And it's a, it's a real challenge and they're great benefits as we all know, but they're also huge challenges to our human infrastructure in a town. So those are my two questions. Thanks, Thanks. Allison. Uh, Nancy, do you wanna uh, tackle that first one about the, the goal? I mean, it, it's more units, but it's kind of a depends, which is often the, uh, uh, often what happens. Yeah, as we, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we would like to, um, we want to, we want to do as much as we can. We think we can start with a goal of creating somewhere between 150 and 300 of units of affordable housing. And those would be, that may actually be talking about five or 600 total units of housing, but um, we're talking about mixed income housing. So it's hard to answer the exact um, goal as a number of units. Mm, the investments to support acquiring and preserving an, a, a home versus constructing a new one, <laughs> it's gonna take a different amount of money to do those two different things. Um, I think um, one of our goals is can we, can we raise, um, can we raise say $10 million locally from local investments that we can then leverage and, um, and use towards creating those new housing units? So it's, uh, it's both how much can we raise locally, where do we direct it, and, um, and how quickly we can deploy it. But so we think that's a big impact. Um, Allison, when I looked at, uh, when you look at how many affordable homes are in the community now, you know, homes that um, uh, are in uh, 
rental, rentals that are serving the workforce um, that are, have rent restrictions, I think there are about 500 or so in the region. And so if you think about if we could create 200, 300 more, that's quite a big lift, though I know on the number side, we're talking about, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of units are needed. But uh, several folks have talked about this incremental approach, right? The ADU, the shared housing, um, we've just got to keep increasing the number. Thanks, Nancy. Um, any way in on the uh, on on your second question, Allison, or Allison's second question about uh, um, other ways to engage the community in um, in and second home ownership? Um, I think the uh, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, I. I Man, I think I've talked with Allison about this a little before, but uh, it's going to come down probably to a state legislative stuff, uh, probably around taxation, um, because all else being equal, if, if you can make a ton of money doing that, you know, people are going to make a ton of money doing that. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, so you have to stop them from making a ton of money doing that or put caps on there or, or other things. Um, but, and again, it's not a bad thing. Um, it's a thing that maybe a lot of residents can use to help themselves stay in town, um, but it's, it's something that needs care and motivation. Thanks. There's another question here about, um, a, a couple of questions around, I'll call it grassroots engagement, um, you know, and mobilizing our, uh, our, our, Citizen planning boards, most of the volunteer or most of the towns, you know, where the people are planners or volunteers, um, busy people, and, and some are on this call, um, many are not. The, uh, and, and we also have a lot of uh, people in our town who are, you know, small trades. Um, you know, how do we, uh, are, there, are there structures within Keys to Valley or um, in, in Tyler within your ADU model? Or, or in our home share, you know, how, how do we tap into the, to the resource and then also provide the education and support to people? Um, you know, the, we've talked about zoning change. Um, you know, what, how, do, how do you get that popularity for, um, you know, it's not, if you've got a citizen zoning board, um, uh, you know, who's got a little bit of time to look at an issue, how do we help them um, enable things and, and then engage their neighbors in, in, uh, in making a difference? Um, thoughts on that from, uh, from their home share or, or uh, ADU program or, or Paul, your work, you've done a lot. Actually, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, uh, we talked about you know, some government intervention and, you know, I know that in a town I live in Chester here and I've seen since I've been here about 10 years now, uh, I, I've seen a, no, a growth in uh, this, this type of housing, people, second homes and Airbnbs and things like that. So, I mean, I think it, it's a tricky uh, situation because you don't want to discourage that. We, you know, there's about five places you can ski around here. So that's really what it is. You know, it's bringing people up to, to do that. So maybe, you know, with some government intervention, maybe some higher taxes or whatever, but maybe creating uh, some sort of incentive for the people that are buying second homes to turn those uh, single family homes into multi unit homes, you know, which, you know, converting a, a, a old Victorian to a, uh, that's only one single family, uh, sometimes it can be a matter of popping up a couple of walls, adding a kitchen and a bathroom, and, you know, and you have another unit right there, and then you can, you can create a whole unit that's annual, you know, annual rented, and, and still come up and enjoy your vacation home, you know, and so it, it really, it, it's just going to take a lot of different, you know, thinking and the, like someone mentioned earlier there's a lot of uh minds here that uh with creative ideas and uh, i'm loving some what i'm hearing today so Can someone else speak in fact <laughs> thank you paul yeah. I, oh sorry go ahead i see elizabeth burlos has her hand up so we'll give her the last question but if there's another answer for that go ahead yeah, I was just going to add a little bit to what paul was saying and i th think a lot of the models really showed how residents can be involved in many different capacities. And I just wanted to mention one, one tool in the Keys to the Valley toolbox that is a priority for, for us moving forward, uh, is likely to be, um, is our local 
renovation or developer utility that really gets at helping homeowners become developers, whether that's through renovation or adding an ADU through um, improvements or connecting to contractors. And that's also a way for our local contractors to get involved and help make these things happen on a smaller scale and kind of crowdsource some of these incremental options that might be make it more affordable um, to do on a larger scale. As we all know that building one by one is hard, but if we can try to support each other in doing it. So there's a lot of different options and I'm glad that many of them have been highlighted today, but we hope that that utility, local utility might be another new uh, option moving forward that we'll look into more. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, the um, Brattleboro Area Affordable Housing. So having a, a small, <clears throat> you know, local board, dedicated people who are there to help people makes a huge difference. Part of uh, our uh, exit strategy from the Montpelier pilot program as we look to expand uh, is cr the creation of the Montpelier, <laughs> Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, that's not my uh Thing, but that's I'm working with Barbara Conray there and she's so she's uh, heading that up and we're trying to bring the ADUs into that so creating that that group of local people that that are, are dedicated um, to to helping is a really important part of of that process especially with the ADUs thanks Tyler um I Mike, could I I'm sorry Mike could I just chime in I you know I think on the question of sort of the volunteer and uh, the role of, you know, regional planning and so forth. I mean, I think the, the key point that I want to throw out there is that Kevin, Olivia, and myself, we, we exist to help towns out. And, um, you know, volunteer board members are asked to do increasingly more complex things. And, you know, we're here to help, basically. And the, the Keys project does have a few things, you know, that we hope are helpful for you. For example, there's a, like a checklist that you could do like an audit of your zoning and that sort of thing. And you know, some of that might be helpful, but the bottom line is call us, uh, email us. Uh, we're, we're here to help you through it. And um, I just want to throw that out there because they're the volunteer board members uh, jobs are getting harder every day. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Representative Burroughs, we're running out of time for the questions. So if you wouldn't mind putting it in the chat, I'll try to make sure we get the answer back to you. Um, thank you. I'd be grateful for that. Um, Doreen, can you pop us up with the last couple of slides? Yeah, so next steps and how do we measure progress? Um, these are great questions. People are obviously motivated here, want to do something, and it's a really, really big challenge um, that, that we need many more people than us to solve. So how do we get going? Um, and and the key thing is actually to pick a piece that you can work on and to work on it. Um, and maybe you've seen that piece today. Um, maybe you need to think a little more. Well, uh, pop over to the keys to the Valley Toolbox and, and see what you see there if you need some more inspiration. And, and for tracking our progress, um, over the last decade, we've been, or we have been counting the homes we've been creating over the last decade. And, and we've got that count available. You can click the link in the slides when you get it. Um, but we'll be, we'll be continuing that count to see what we're doing and publishing that through keys. Um, so I'm gonna ask, uh, well, I guess one other thing I need, the next slide, if you bring it up, Doreen, um, that whatever piece of the puzzle you choose to work on, you are not alone. This slide shows just a few of the organizations that are investing their time and energy and funds because they have faith and confidence in each other and in us that we can do this. So pick your piece and, Join these leaders and, and be on the leaderboard. Um, we, we can do this together. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew, and he's going to wrap all this great thinking up into one fabulous synopsis. Is that what's going to happen, Andrew? I'm going to I'm going to try, Mike. Um, <laughs> oh, you. Good morning, everyone. Andrew Winter, Executive Director at Twin Pines Housing. It is so great to have 130 people here this morning uh, talking about housing. Uh, it's it's something that I know, Mike. The folks at Vital Communities and I and a whole lot of people have a lot of passion for. Uh, so it's great to see the energy. Partnerships are key. Here's an example 
this is a, a four unit project that we're, we just finished. We're moving people into this weekend. Uh, four units in Wilder on a remediated brownfield site, completed this week, uh, takes lots of partners, Mascoma Bank, BHFA, Two Rivers, Evernorth, Green Mountain Economic Development. We're all partners in making this happen along with uh, others of the state of Vermont. Um, those partnerships are critically important. Uh, don't be afraid to think and reach out for partners. Next slide. And, you know, these approaches um, that you heard about today, it's great to hear them because it's a wonderful example. Clearly, all kinds of housing are needed. Um, I love the housing fund uh, because there's a real need for particularly that sort of missing middle. I had somebody call me up, ask me, what's the wait list up at Guile Hill where we have some moderate income units? Two years, two years. 22 uh, folks on the wait list, two-year wait list for some of those moderate income rental units there. Mixed income zoning changes, home shares, rehab units, accessory dwelling units, all these are going to be part of the solution. So grab onto something. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Vital Communities. Uh, thanks. Uh, good job, everyone. Um, but, but, but find a way to be involved. Thank you to our presenters today for your time, your energy, and thank you to everyone who, who joined us. We'll call it there, Mike. All right. <laughs> Great to be part of this breakfast. I hope it was satisfying. I'm looking forward to being together in person. It's coming. Uh, hang in there and, and let's, let's solve this challenge together.